Gentlemen and ladies, about 3% of you, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is going to be pretty long because it's on CRDTs, which is a complicated topic. And frankly, according to my video analytics, most of you tend to only last about three minutes. That being said, that's pretty good because I typically tend to only last about one minute. So without further ado, let's get into this video and get it done. All right, so let's get started. The iPad is out. So to remind everyone what was happening last video, basically we know that in multi-leader replication, we are prone to write conflicts. So when a write conflict inevitably happens, what can we do? Well, we have three options. The first one is last write wins, AKA LWW, which I'm now gonna write right here. Uh, last write wins is not really very reliable because we can't really trust timestamps in distributed systems because they can get out of sync with one another and jump around due to NTP. Additionally, a second option is we can detect concurrent writes via something like a version vector, which allows us to see when two writes knew about one another or did not. And then we can go ahead and store both writes in the database, known as storing siblings. We can eventually then have the user merge them down the line. A third option is to actually have the database merge them automatically. So my pen keeps not working here. And that is known as a CRDT or, of course, a conflict-free replicated data type. So what is actually the meaning of these things? Well, what is a CRDT? Let's imagine that we've got two leaders over here on our left and we're trying to build a shopping list and we've got basically two sets of items. So on the left, we've got one guy who's written now uh, ham and eggs. And on the right, we've got a second guy who's making conflicting rights saying milk and cookies. And what we want is for these two sets to eventually converge, right? We want both leaders to agree on the value of the shopping cart. So ideally what we would want is eventually both of those leaders are going to agree that ham, eggs, milk, and cookies are what's actually in the set. That is the ideal scenario here. So how can we actually go about doing this? Well, that's going to come up in a bit, but let's first quickly, in response to a comment left by one of my viewers, talk about where CRDTs can actually be used. Well, some databases that we might see them are RIAC, which is a multi-leader slash leaderless distributed key value store. I'll talk about that more in a future video. And the second one is Redis, which is a completely in-memory database often used for caching. In their enterprise version, they use CRDTs for sets. Redis, again, is something I will talk about in a future video. So let's talk about two possible implementations of CRDTs before I talk about specific data structures that we can implement with them. So let's recall from last video the concept of a distributed counter. We're going to use the distributed counter here to demonstrate what an operational CRDT is. So remember that we can demonstrate kind of a distributed, eventually consistent counter by this list right here, which is basically a version vector. But the point is, every single element of the list indicates how many increments we've seen from each leader. So this two delegates that we've seen two increments from the first leader, the one delegates that we've seen one increment from the second leader, and then the zero says that we've seen no increments from the third leader. Now obviously each of these leaders is going to keep their own version vector so that they can keep track of their local state of how many increments that they've seen and have been sent. That way the counter is actually just the sum of the elements in the list. So in the case of an operational CRDT, what we're actually doing is instead of sending this whole list from one node to another in our replication setup, we're actually going to send just an operation. So in the case of a distributed counter, there's only one operation and that would be increment. So for example, if this guy gets incremented and this is say the zero with leader, we might go ahead and send inc zero to the next database and that's now going to change its vector to three comma one comma zero. So basically in this case, uh, again, increment just tells the database which index to increment and the advantage of something like an operational CRDT is that you don't actually have to send this full vector, which grows linearly with respect to the number of nodes, but rather you can just send one op uh, operation and this is O of one in terms of space sent over the network. It says sent over network because my handwriting is terrible. Whatever, I'm rushed. So what are the downsides of an operational CRDT? Because we said that as opposed to sending the full vector, now we get to send a lot less over the network. It's going to be a lot faster. Well, there is actually a pretty significant downside, which is that whenever we have causal relationships amongst our operations, an operational CRDT could possibly let us down. So let's imagine that we have a set and we're trying to implement that with a CRDT. 
So in this case, let's say on leader one or database one, I'll just write an L here to indicate it's a leader, and then database two is also a leader. On database one, we're going to first add ham to our set, then we're going to remove ham from our set. And then on database two, we're obviously going to be propagating those operations. So first it receives the fact that we're adding ham, and then it's receiving the fact that we're removing ham from our set. But what if I were to X this out right here? And in turn, we never add ham. So database two only gets that we're removing ham. Now it tries to remove ham from a set that doesn't have ham in it, and we've got a problem. It's gonna throw some sort of error. And obviously that's not acceptable. The point is that these two writes are causally related, right? Because you can only remove ham if you first added it. So it's important actually that if we have an operational CRDT, we need a causally consistent broadcasting system where messages do not get dropped and they also don't get duplicated because these operations are not known as idempotent. Idempotent meaning that, here I'll write it here, but we'll see it later. You can do the same thing many times over and no difference. And I'm saying that these operations are not idempotent, right? If I send the message add ham five times, we're now going to add five quantities worth of ham. So again, this is not going to work for us. We need to make sure that in our message delivery, again, we have no drops and we have no duplicates. So it's very important for operational CRDTs. On the other hand, we have our state-based CRDT. And I was already alluding to this uh, before with sending the whole kind of version vector or sending the whole counter in a distributed counter, but that's what I'm demonstrating here in this diagram. So let's say that this leader on the left has a state of five comma four, right? It's seen five increments to itself. It's seen four increments from the right leader and it sends five four to the second leader, right? Because we're sending the whole state of the CRDT instead of the operations. Then in a state-based CRDT, as opposed to just applying one operation to our local CRDT, we call this merge function right here. And so on the right leader, we're going to be merging our local CRDT with the incoming state-based CRDT. And via this merge function, we now have a new result. So after receiving five comma four, the right database merges and changes itself to five comma six. So what do we actually have to know about the merge function for something like this to work? Well, basically we know that it needs to be commutative, right? Because if the, basically we want the same result whether the right leader is sending its results to the left leader or the left is sending its results to the right leader. We also want it to be associative. Again, this just ensures that no matter what order those state messages are coming in, we don't care. And we also, again, want it to be idempotent. I just explained idempotence before, but the point is if we receive the same state multiple times over, we're not going to mess up our results, right? It has no effect. We just need to receive that state once and we're good to go. So I have the, the concrete mathematical definitions down here. You don't have to focus too hard on those, but if it helps you understand what I mean when I say these things, that's good. So the point of this is if the merge function satisfies all three of these things, it means that we don't actually have to care about what order we receive these state-based updates in, unlike the operational updates, which means we can just go ahead and basically just fire out state-based updates all over the place, and as long as every single node gets them, we'll be eventually consistent. So what does this work really well with? It works really well with something called a gossip protocol. So I haven't explained this yet in this series, but I did definitely explain it in the past one. Basically the gist of this is that it allows you to really easily communicate with a bunch of nodes in the cluster without any messaging middleware. How do we do this? Well, basically we pick one starting point. So let's imagine that this node had, you know, its own counter based CRDT of one comma two or something. And it's now going to pick say any two random nodes in the cluster. So it's got this guy here and this guy here. And now these two nodes are considered infected. So what these two nodes are now going to do in the next round of gossip protocol is also send its message to two more nodes. So as you can see, now these guys are infected. And similarly, you know, maybe it'll send it here. It doesn't matter if this guy receives the message twice because remember, it is idempotent. So receiving that message twice is no big deal. Similarly, you know, if we had another guy sending messages because it has its own counter update to send out. It doesn't matter whether, let's call this message A and message B. It doesn't matter whether A gets there before B or B gets there before A because the merge function is commutative. 
So we're in great shape either way. We just need to make sure that all those messages eventually get passed around and then everything will be eventually consistent. So just to keep demonstrating how this gossip protocol is gonna look, this guy is infected right here. It's gonna pick two random nodes to pass messages to. In the next round, all the newly infected nodes are gonna keep passing messages. They're gonna keep passing messages. They're gonna keep passing messages. And eventually, What's going to happen is all of these CRDT state updates are going to get propagated around the system such that we are eventually consistent and everyone agrees on the state of our CRDT. That's great. So again, even though state CRDTs are good, they are effectively pretty hard to implement sometimes if the amount of data in them is pretty big, right? Because at the end of the day, gossip protocols have no guarantees on necessarily when uh, that update is going to get there. Obviously, it probably will because just randomly speaking, probabilistically speaking, the message is going to get to a node, but it could take a while with all those random iterations to actually get the message to the right node. Additionally, state CRDTs can just be big, and so they can take a lot longer to pass over the network. So now that we've gone over operational versus state-based CRDTs, let's take a look at a few different types of data structures that we can implement via a CRDT and use well in a multi-leader replication setup. Okay, so the first one that we're going to talk about is actually going to be a distributed counter. So I'm trying to zoom here so I get this one right, but you know what, too bad. Just don't, don't focus on the bottom part of the screen, I'm sorry. All right, so the first one is gonna be a counter. We already covered this. It's got one operation where you can basically just call increase. So if we wanted to implement this via an operation-based CRDT, the operation would be increase, where the parameter would just be which leader it's coming from. Similarly, uh, it would hold all of those increases in a single vector, and then to basically get the count on a node, just do sum of the increase vector, right? Because this would be basically six. We've seen, oh my god, I can't, I can't do math, holy shit. It's five, three plus two, wow, who would have thought? Um, next, we've also got a decreasable counter. This one has two operations. You can obviously increase that counter or decrease that counter. And the way we would implement this on every single node is similarly to last time, we would have a list of increments, but we would also have a list of decrements, basically where each decrement is saying, how many decrements have we seen coming from every single leader node? So in this case, the sum is very simple. It's literally just going to be summing up the increments list, zero plus three plus two, and subtracting the sum of the decrements list, zero plus one plus zero. So in that case, it would be four. So that's simple enough, but we can also do a little bit more complicated things. So let's go ahead and build out some sets. I've kind of been implying we could do this anyway, so let's do it. So the operations on a set would be adding and removing, and the way we could easily represent a set on every single node is we basically have all of the elements that we've inserted, that's called the adds, and all of the elements that we've deleted, which we will in turn call the, the removes. And so to actually get the representation of the set on an individual node, you take all of the elements in the, ha in the adds. So in that case, that would be ham, eggs, and cheese. And then you would get rid of cheese because it's in the remove set. So this works really nicely because now for our merge function, all we actually have to do is take the union of two add sets and the union of two remove sets. And by doing so, we can easily basically have a right conflict-free representation of a set. Now, if you think about this, there actually is one issue with this representation, which is that once an element goes in the removes list, so cheese right here, it can never be re-added back to the set because I've said that the set is, you're basically, if cheese is ever present in the adds, you're always getting rid of it because it's in the remove set. So how can we do this where we're basically able to add an element back? Well, one way that would be pretty cool is you basically just pick a random tag with every single addition to the set that you do. So now in your add set, we've got a ham with an add identifier of one, two, three, eggs with an add identifier of seven, six, two, and let's say some other leader wanted to add ham again, now the add identifier might be two, four, one. On the other hand, let's now say that at the time the set only had these elements right here, that someone went ahead and said, I want to uh, remove ham123. And so now ham123 goes in the removes list, but at the same time, if another leader basically went ahead and said, okay, well, I'm adding ham241, 
we know that HAM241 hasn't actually been canceled out yet, so our resulting set is going to be these two guys right here. So now we have eggs and ham. So by virtue of having these unique tags, we have to basically uh, you know, know about the write already in order to cancel it out. And additionally, it means that we can rewrite things back into a set, which is great because it limits us quite a bit less. So moving on to the last topic of the video, which isn't really a topic, but it's more so a teaser for a future video. The last thing we're going to talk about is sequence CRDTs. So this is basically making a list in a write conflict free way. And that's going to be really, really tough because the issue with a list is that it depends on an ordering of some elements. And if you don't know about the elements beforehand when you're making that write, it's kind of hard to just go ahead and make an arbitrary ordering over them. So sequence CRDTs are very tough in practice to actually implement, but some people have made them really well. There's some really cool open source versions of these, and they actually power a lot of the technology behind real-time collaborative text editors uh, like Google Docs or, I don't know, I think um, VS Code has some text editor. I'm sure there are plenty of others you can think of. But the point is, I am eventually going to dedicate a video to these alone because not only do they come up in interviews, but they're just a pretty cool topic in general. That one may come up in a while since it's a little bit less relevant to what we're talking about right now. But either way, hope you guys are looking forward to it. Well guys, hope you enjoyed the video. I will see you in the next one and uh, hope everyone got through this. If you only lasted three minutes, you're like all the rest of the men in the world, so don't worry about it. <laughs>